that's all right. <laughs> we had an evening last night with um, the media crew and they told me I needed to put some powder on my head <laughs> because the, the light reflects off it. And I was thinking, no, that's my halo. That's what I'm like. But whatever's happened already, and it, with, with that, this is the part that you're really thinking about, isn't it? What's he like? How's it going to work? I heard somebody say once that um, bad preaching was God's joke on a prayerless church. <laughs> so if it's not, not up to scratch, you know what you've got to do. <laughs> and they call this blame shifting. So it's not my fault anymore. <laughs> but it's, um, it's where we all come together. So anyway, let's... Um, we're going to be looking at this um, series on Acts, and I wonder, as we as we do that, and you've we've, we've mentioned over, over the recent weeks that this is the series that we're coming into. Wonder what your thoughts, are. what what are we going to get from Acts? So what I'd like you to do right now, just just take a moment in your own heart to. Ask the Spirit of God to actually take something out of what we're going to share today and bring that into your heart. Perhaps it might be an action. Perhaps it's a, a thought change. Perhaps it's, it's something which He wants to bring into your heart and life and into your sphere of influence. I want you just to reflect on that as we start this, uh, not just today, but start this whole series over these next few weeks in this amazing, amazing book. Father, as we come and we open this amazing account of what happened in those first decades of, of your church, we want to come and we want to ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring something into our hearts that is going to be transformational. Something that's going to direct our hearts more to you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we open our hearts to you. As God's agent amongst us today, that you might just reveal who we are in you and in Christ as we come and bring this uh, together in our thinking. Give us hearts that are open, ears to hear, eyes to see whatever it is that you have for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read three scriptures together as we, as we start. The first is from Luke chapter 24, 40 to 40, 44 to 49. Then he, that is Jesus, said... When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said, Yes, it, is, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of, the, of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all of these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. And then in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Luke carrying on the story that he had written to his friend Theophilus. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do 
and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. And I take it from that, he's saying, that's what Jesus did, but this is what I'm going to tell you that Jesus continued to do by his Spirit as we move forward from here. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, and I... I just noticed that just when I was revising this again. He actually command, made this as a command to them that they were to not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promised that we read about in Luke chapter, chapter 24. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then from Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made, was made as clear to you as if you had seen the picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? I'm really excited about doing this series. Not because I chose it, because I didn't choose it. It was when I was told that the decision had been made that we want to look at, at, look at Acts. And over the at the end of last year, you did a series, a 10-part series on the, on the work and ministry and person of, of the Holy Spirit. And I take it that through, through that series, there was a theology of the Spirit which was taught and that uh, you understand something of who He is and, and what, he, what He does. But when we come to, 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 to act, I see this as the flip side of those, of those 10, 10 weeks. And this series is going to be saying to you, 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 you know him, you know you, you've got this head knowledge, you've got this theology about the Holy Spirit, but now Luke wants us to see how this actually works out in the life of the church. This, this reality, this, this person, is he just, just there to, to say, well, we've got this knowledge now, but what, what about the outworking of that? How's it going to come to, come to pass? And it's my prayer and expectation that by the time that we get to the end of this, sometime towards the end of May, uh, that we are going to be both individually and as a congregation dramatically different because we understand how the Holy Spirit wants to work in us and through us, in the church, in the community, and, uh, and, and, wherever, we, and wherever, we go, wherever we go. And I better get my clicker here. Oops. Thanks, guys. You're really onto it. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones called Acts the most lyrical of books. He said, Live in that book, I exhort you. It is a tonic, the greatest tonic I know in the realm of the Spirit. I love that. It's a tonic. So, what I'm going to suggest to you to, to make sure that you enjoy the tonic is to Take two chapters of Acts, read two chapters of Acts each day. And as you do, be asking the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you in a practical way and how he wants you to live and work and move in and, and you, and your family, in your workplace, in your community, in your neighborhood. What's the impact of that Spirit as you do that? So two chapters a day. Love it. Love it, learn from it, believe it, experience it, fall in love with it. And as you do fall in love with the book, I'm sure that you will fall in love with the Holy Spirit, who just happens to be the Father's and the Son's sole agent on earth at the present moment. In Acts chapter 2, 32 and 33, 
Luke says that God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as, as he had promised, gave him, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. So two chapters a day will take you two weeks. That's, there's 28 chapters, two days. That's, my maths tells me that's, that's about right. <clears throat> and if at the end of that, you haven't started to really get to, to experience the, 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 the essence of it and the power of it, then just start over again. And go through another two weeks. And if you're still struggling with that, again. And if you're still struggling, perhaps you need to be praying that God will do something different. But I wanted to go back a little bit and give a little bit of my personal journey for a moment. Just uh, how, how I've been impacted for this. For years I viewed Acts as merely a history in the life of the early church. Luke, of course, was an excellent historian. When you go through his his gospel and now come into Acts, you find his attention to detail and specific events as as being uh, amazing. As a history, I found Acts incredibly exciting and inspiring and even applicable at times to to perhaps me and the church. But I still felt there was a need for caution here. You You just can't go getting too carried away with what was happening then. You see, the question was... Was Acts a descriptive book telling us of what happened back in the church? Or is Acts a prescriptive book telling us how the Spirit wants to operate in the church? And my problem was I had been taught for so long that it was descriptive. In other words, just tuck tuck it away. It's fine. The Spirit did that. That's how it worked. That's how the church was born. That was the, the, the way it, it carried out. But don't get too carried away with the, with the detail of how the Spirit worked. And that has troubled me. Now I probably have come to the position where I believe that my previous position in that was wrong. I've started to understand that perhaps it is, it is, it is both. It is telling us how the Spirit worked in the birth of the church and the dramatic things that happened, the miracles that took place, the lives that were changed, the churches that were planted, the impact that it had, that it was brought to flip the world upside down. It had all of that. It's a great story. But it's also prescriptive that what happened in the book of Acts was thought of as normative to the life of the church. In 2009, I wrote an article for the Treasury Magazine. Anybody remember Treasury Magazine? Okay, oh man. Oh, Treasury, great. Well, I was disappointed when GPH pulled the plug on that and said it's not gonna be printed anymore. But anyway, I printed this, I wrote this article which was printed over two, two sessions. I was wordy in those days. And it was entitled, Where is the Holy Spirit, Alcatraz or the Circus? And in that article, I reflected on my own personal journey <clears throat> and those of the, of the churches where I, had, where I had been brought up. And in the 1960s and 70s, I believe that we had the Holy Spirit locked up in our spiritual Alcatraz, where he couldn't get out even, even if he wanted to. <clears throat> and that was because of what we thought were the events that were going on in the circus out there. And what was done in the name of the Spirit, which was beyond our reasoning and understanding, and we thought was a bit bit foolish at times. It was at a time when if we mentioned, and I was just starting out and and preaching back in the the late 60s, early 70s, and if you mentioned the Holy Spirit more than two or three times in a sermon, you would get somebody that would be telling you to be careful. You're actually steading on, walking on some thin ice here. You, You might just go too far the other way. And so there was warnings that were put out, which in the end ended up by crushing the spirit and silencing the spirit in in what we were doing. And tragically, our spirit, our trinity rather, became Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. And that badly interpreted in in my understanding now of some of those those things. So as we come into this series, I want to... I want you to let go of some of that fear. If you, if you, like me, have had that fear of the Spirit, 
of what he might do, of the things he might expect, the, the changes he might bring in my life, the influences that might come to bear. And we're not quite sure where they're going to take us. And we're afraid of that. I'm going to pray that as we come through this series, that we will be released from that fear. That he may, he may not do some things exactly the same way as he did then, but he will do some things that are directly related to the Holy Spirit. It can only be described as God things, as spiritual surprises. He is a creative, he is as creative and active and powerful now as he ever was then, if we will let him. So I'd say let's fasten our seat belts and enjoy the ride as we seek to discover what he wants us to learn from Acts over these next few months. If I were to give this message another title, it would probably be the, the, <clears throat> the person you can't live without. And tragically, for me personally, and I fear for many of my peers in the history that we had, we tried to live our Christian lives without the Spirit. Oh, we knew that he was there, but we, we had him locked up in Alcatraz. We didn't want him to, to invade our time and space. We were comfortable as things were. And I'm sure Jesus didn't want him to do anything too radical either. He cannot, should not be ignored or boxed in. And yet for many of us, we ignored him for too long. And it's my prayer that as we even come through this introduction, that we will be able to loose ourselves from some of those things and, and more purposely experience the power of the Holy Spirit and walk more in step with him as Paul encouraged the Galatians to do. The one thing that can, can stop us and stop this from happening is fear, which is false evidence appearing real. We're given the wrong, we've been given the wrong message for too long on who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. Two ways in which we can respond to that, and I can't quite read that back there. Um, <clears throat> forget everything and run, or face everything and rise. And we want to face everything and rise above that. So I want to now spend this next little while just exploring some of the, the themes, and I'll do it today and next Sunday as well, some of the themes that come out of... Um, <clears throat> Of this, of this book. And the first of those is going to be when the Spirit of God is at work, there is a passionate message that we have, and we find this in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is a person with a life transforming message, and that transform, transformed the lives of many that day and in subsequent days as he went about his work. The core of their faith was the message of Christ. And the, the message of his, of his life, his death, his resurrection, that was, that was the core of their message. They didn't try and explain it, they just, they just declared it. The dominant theme was his resurrection. <clears throat> and this message didn't come from just a mental vacuum, it came from time spent with the Lord Jesus. They had lived with him, they had walked with him, they had talked with him. And eventually, as Luke reminded us there at the end of chapter 24, that eventually the scales were removed from their eyes and they could see all that Jesus was and all that he had been, been, taking, ten, been teaching them. It came from submission to the controlling power of the Spirit as they were baptized and filled by him. There was exuberant fellowship amongst them. The impact of the Holy Spirit was seen in new relationships that developed and the new depth of those relationships. Perhaps we can, you can gauge the impact of the fullness of the Spirit in your life as, as I can in mine by my attitudes towards the corporate worship, to prayer, to genuine fellowship. And summing these up, our commitment to, to our love for and relationships with and desire to be with fellow believers in, in a corporate sense. <clears throat> They celebrated their sense of community. They didn't grumble about being together. In fact, they longed for it. People didn't have to be bribed and cajoled to come to meetings with fancy things. They just wanted to be together with the believers. 
They had this one thing in common, that Jesus was their Lord, Jesus was their King, Jesus was their focus, empowered by the Spirit. And they, didn't, they, they, they couldn't stop sharing that relationship with each other. These were their friends, their brothers and sisters for eternity, and they wanted to get to know them best now. They wanted to know what God was doing in their lives and how they could share with it and share with them. Their relationship for each other meant more than just coming together once a week in a, in a, in a service such as this or in a, in a cell group, connect group situation. They longed to be with each other. In fact, they were together every day with, e with each other. They, they just loved being together so much. It was their daily experience. Spirit-filled people don't see meeting on every and any occasion with others as a chore. It was their number one commitment. If they could find a reason to be together, they just got together. They loved it. They loved each other. And their fellowship and relationship resulted in meaningful and specific prayer and support for one another. You see, because they knew each other, because they were in con contact with each other, they knew how to pray for each other. They knew how to support one another and to live with, it, with, and to live with each other. They loved, they really loved each other. And this love was, ev was an evident sign that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it is impossible to be an unloving and un unforgiving person to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot be unloving and unforgiving and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you need to be more loving and more forgiving. And if you're not going to be that way, then don't expect to be filled with the Spirit. That, that's par for the course. By this will all men know, the Scriptures tell us, that we are his disciples by the fact that we love one another. It's love of another kind. Then there was their corporate communion together. This was in Acts 2 and then right through and you get in Acts 20 and verse 7 as well. They were fulfilling God's command to remember him in the special service. They came together. Each time they came together, they would be breaking bread together. They would be remembering. This was a fresh and dynamic experience for them. And I wonder sometimes if sometimes the more, more precious moments of communion are when we do that in small groups. I don't know if it's part of your, your um, connect group program, but if it's not, introduce it. Start to say, let's, let's have communion tonight. Let's just worship tonight. Let's just be in his presence tonight and take communion together. And in that communion, we're celebrating our unity together our love together because he has brought us into, into that place. It's not ritual, it should be reality. Is it one year's exuberant experience that we repeat 20, 30, 40 years? We live back in that time when, when it was really precious to us, but we just go through the ritual now? Or is it something which is fresh and vital and, and every time we come and every time we take communion, it is just that, there's something about it. There's something special about it. And I can remember, it's a terrible thing to have to say, isn't it? I can remember when. <laughs> Growing up, I used to think, man, we do this every week. It's the same old, same old. You know, get up, somebody gives thanks for the bread. We take the bread, pass it around. Somebody gets up, gives thanks for the cup. We take the cup, take up the offering, move on. It's just, we've done our bit again. It's just, but there are times when, when we just need to stop and remember and be in his presence. This, we, we often think with, with communion primarily of his death and resurrection, uh, mainly his death. But we need to stop and remember that he is alive. Uh, did you get that in the, in the scripture where it says Jesus met with these, these disciples after his resurrection, convincing them that he was alive? And here he is standing amongst them. And he's saying, I had to convince them that it's me. It's, I'm, I'm alive. I'm, I'm here. I think sometimes when we take communion, there needs to be that sense of joy and, and victory and celebration that this one who gave his life, shed his blood, body broken, 
rose from the dead. He he, he ascended to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God. He's in control. He's ruling. He's reigning. And he's coming back. Sorry, that didn't sort of... Great, thanks. (laughs) Anyway, they had corporate communion together. Then it, it dramatically changed their prayer life. They came together and prayed. Circumstances changed within their lives. In Acts 1, 4, 2, 42, 4, 24. They, it, prayer became the, the dominant thing. They saw God do stuff through their prayers that they would never have seen had they not been together and prayed. And if reading through Acts doesn't re- reinvigorate your desire for corporate prayer, you probably need to pray for a real new heart transplant. Similar to what the, the prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 36, where, where God said, I'm going to take away your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, something that will actually pulsate and pound with a love for me. Prayer strengthened their faith. It empowered their ministries. It was after they had prayed that the earth shook and prison doors were opened. It was when they prayed that chains fell off and, and things that bound people there was release from, from, from those things. They were empowered in their ministries. It encouraged their faith and their strength. And prayer, <clears throat> through prayer, the Holy Spirit brought many surprises into their lives. And I, I think we get a little bit carried away sometimes when we're thinking about miracles. I just like to think that the, their spirit inspired surprises, things that I didn't quite expect. And they can be big things or little things, but they're surprises that he brings just to remind me that he's in control. That he's there, he's, he's, he's wanting to be involved. <clears throat> Through prayer, they removed many obstacles. They conquered uh, demonic forces. They defeated enemies. They healed diseases, released people from prison, planted churches, heard God speak to them, and accomplished the otherwise impossible. How are our prayer times? Does that, does that sort of, we say, yeah, 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 that's, that's us? That, that's how... That, we see that or say oh man I wish we were like in the book of Acts wish we were seeing chains broken wish we were seeing prison doors open wish we were seeing healings take place that that can only be, be be described as a God thing wish we were seeing churches new churches planted new souls being saved they were a powerful church because they were a praying church and here's my challenge out of this one thought that if we're not seeing the blessings that God wants to, that we believe God wants for us, check our prayer life as a church. I think we're still a long way from, from where we need to be with that. <clears throat> Coming up, we've talked about this already with the elders, and we're going to be doing what you did last year, but in a different format 21 days of prayer and fasting, seeking a breakthrough. I believe God wants to do something different amongst us. And we need to see a breakthrough. And so we're going to take some time out in, in, in April, 23rd of April to the 13th of May, 21 days where we're going to be focusing on prayer and fasting. And we'll have a, have a, a book, which I think is um, here. It's all right, dear. Got it? Um, and we'll just follow it through. Each day there'll be something different to do. But during those three day, three weeks, there'll be three Saturdays. And we're going to be calling the church to come together here on Saturday, three Saturday mornings between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock to pray. I remember, oh, here we go again. Um, there was a, a man of God who many of you older ones with, with this color hair and my age will remember called Fred King in Auckland. And he would go around preaching in conferences and and sharing the word of God with us. And I remember we used to call him King Fred, but Fred would would say there were three three things. The the Sunday morning time was sort of the the popularity of the hour. It was a good time to meet together. You could have a bit of a sleep in. You could rock up to church about 11 o'clock, and that was just a very comfortable sort of thing. Those days we did an evening service as well. And, and Fred used to say that that was the popularity of the preacher. If he had preached in the morning, 
you had to judge whether it was worth coming out to Sunday night or not. So you'd, you'd popularity of the hour, popularity of the preacher. And Wednesday night was, or midweek, it was your prayer and Bible study night. And he said, that was the popularity of the Lord. Now, always stuck with me. Yeah, 11 o'clock's a good time. I can manage that. Yeah, if he's a good preacher, I'll, I'll go out. Oh, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm too something else. To, I can't quite make it on, on Wednesday night for prayer and to learn more about him. So we want to, we want to crack through that, all right? So... You'll be hearing more about that, so put it in your, in your minds, get ready for it. If you're unsure about it, start Googling fasting. If you want to be more specific, Google Daniel fasting, because that's the fasting that we'll be promoting through that. Get, get familiar with it and get your heart ready for it, so that when we start, we're not going to be starting from inertia, that we're going to have some momentum for that already. And it will help us to, to become more aware of what it means to be a spirit-filled church then there, there was the experiences of the God-shaped surprises when the Holy Spirit is working people are filled with awe of him things happen that can only be described as a God thing Hebrews 11 tells us a Hebrew, uh, yeah, Hebrews 11 tells us without faith it is impossible to please God without faith you're not going to see some of these things happen you need to believe that they're going to happen and that they will happen and that he can make them happen and Hebrews 11 is that great faith chapter and you can see how God worked in those, those times amongst those people the Holy Spirit will take you out of your comfort zone he will work outside your box if you'll let him and he will test you and challenge you he can restore broken homes and shattered lives. He can give, he can give um, love for the unlovable and give us a touch for the untouchable. He can shatter the chains of drugs, alcohol, lust, pornography, promiscuity, bitterness, unforgiveness, pride and anger and any other chains that might be binding us and stopping us from being filled with his spirit and operating in the power of that spirit. As a church lays aside the sins of prejudice and arrogance, apathy, and any sin that is binding it, it takes up the challenge to pray and to seek God's face. He will bring his healing. I guess if I, most of us, many of us anyway, would be able to quote Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If we couldn't quote it, we were familiar with it. Where the chronicler starts to say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray uh, and seek my face, I'll, I'll hear from heaven, I'll heal their land. I'll, my ear will be attentive to them. I will listen to them. But what's the answer for that? What's the key? He says, if my people, if, if you do it, if you will humble yourself, if you will forgive, if you will pray, then I will hear. The responsibility on us is to do what he asks us to do. We should be less concerned by the fact that the Holy Spirit might do something miraculous and more concerned if he doesn't. If we read the book of Acts with the idea that, this is, that as time, uh, time went on, the, the miraculous stopped, I think you are misreading the story. Luke is doing a number of things through this book. His primary focus, purpose, his primary focus is to tell how the Holy Spirit empowered and directed witness, how it went through from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Start in Jerusalem in Acts 1, and it's by the time you get to Acts 28, it's gone ballistic. <clears throat> His primary role is not to give endless lists of miracles. He selects those things which are important to the story that he's wanting to tell and convincing his friend Theophilus that this is part of the story. This is part of the evidence that the Holy Spirit is alive and well and is, is willing to fill and empower his people. The greatest miracle that Luke emphasizes is the miracle of the changed life evidenced in the planning of churches across Asia and Europe of that time. And he states other miraculous occurrences as if they were to be expected. He, it's, you don't get the, the, get the feeling when you're reading through Acts that Luke is at all surprised or his readers are going to be at all surprised because God did something amazing. Like if God does something amazing here, we write a book about it, we do a conference thing about it, we, we, we publicize it, as if this is, this is unusual. But for them it was usual. 
This was normative Christian living for them. This is what happens within the church. It was the islanders in Malta who were surprised that Paul didn't die when uh, they'd been shipwrecked and were on the island and they built a fire and Paul's doing his bit to stoke it up and a, a snake jumps out and bites him and then, then the, the islanders are busy there. Oh, he was a bad one. That's why the, they thought he, was going to, he thought he was going to get away with the shipwreck but no, no, fate has, fate has got it and he's, he's going to die and they just waited for him to swell up and die. And they waited they waited oh perhaps we'll change our story perhaps he wasn't a real baddie perhaps he's a goodie perhaps he's a god perhaps he's got the supernatural power that 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 and they were the ones who were surprised but Luke didn't seem to be surprised and Paul didn't seem to be surprised that was just what happened Christopher Berendt made this comment. After his suffering and death, Jesus presented himself to his apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Jesus proved that he was alive, that he was Lord. God always shows himself to be the living God. Human progress towards God is rooted in this fact that God shows us that he lives by the ways in which he shows himself, are diff- but the ways in which he shows himself are different at different times. We are not likely to experience it the way Abraham did. For Moses, the way God revealed himself had a special character that accorded with the needs of his time. God disclosed himself in a a different way to Samuel than he did to Isaiah. It is always different, yet always the same. God shows himself to be a living God. And as I read through Acts and I read these miracles, I think, well, it, it, it might not work that I'm going to put a handkerchief on somebody and they're going to heal. But there will be some way in which God is going to reveal himself supernaturally and powerfully by his spirit for this 20th century period. He is a 20th century living God. And he is creative and active as he's ever been. And he will show that in a 20th century way if we will open our hearts to him. So what am I saying in this? The Holy Spirit is God and act sovereignly according to his purposes. If he wants to spring surprises on his people, then he's able to do that for the glory of God. Secondly, the preaching of the gospel is accompanied by miracles, and there were affirming signs that this was the message of God. And God never uses miracles as entertainment. They were always for a purpose. So two questions. How well do you know the Spirit, Holy Spirit? And how rich is your fellowship with Him? On a scale of 1 to 10, yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you be? Where would you, where would you fit yourself on those two questions? Then as you think about that, you might be an eight or a nine, or you might be a two or a three. When you think about that, what is something that you could do this week to lift that one or two points? How can you get to know him better? And how can you enjoy fellowship with him more? Your experience and fellowship with the Holy Spirit will depend will deepen as you give him unhurried time. You unbox your expectations of him. You surrender to his fullness in your life and you enjoy the comfort and fellowship that the Holy Spirit brings and resist the fear of him. If Bex and Holly can come up and we'll, we're just wrapping up now. So take a moment to reflect on what the Holy Spirit has placed in your heart in response to your prayer at the start of this message. What's he asking of you? What's he challenged you with? And what's our response going to be? Is he asking you to respond to his love, death and resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus? Who wants to forgive you of your sins and who, who wants to bring transformation into your life? And you're saying, Russell, I... I I don't even know Jesus, let alone know this person you're talking about with the Holy Spirit. 
But if what you're saying is right about him, then I want that. I want to walk with him. I want him to be part of my life. I want him to be breaking the chains and the shackles of, of my life. Is he asking you to step out of your fear and to walk in step with him in a new and dynamic experience with him and to release the Holy Spirit from your own man-made Alcatraz box? Are you willing to, to say, Holy Spirit, here I am. Fill me, use me, empower me. Is there some spirit grieving, spirit quenching activity that you are pursuing that you need to repent of? You know that he's not happy with you because of what is happening in your life. The thoughts that you're having, the actions that you're taking. Is the spirit grieved and quenched? And he needs you to come in a spirit of repentance and confession. And when you do that, he will come in response with filling and empowerment. Are you trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit without the Spirit? Instead of letting him empower you, you're, you're just going through the motions. You're, you're putting energy into it. You're putting all sorts of stuff into it. But there's no letting the Spirit of God do it. How's he resp how are you responding? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us enough to have poured out your Holy Spirit through Jesus into the earth, into the world. And through him, you're transforming lives universally and you're transforming lives locally. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here in us, among us, willing to empower us and to fill us, to change us, that the fruit that you create within us will show us more about who Jesus is. Fill us, empower us, in Jesus' name.